So we are recording tonight's program, but welcome to our virtual presentation tonight. My name is Karina Kowalski, and I am the Manager of Education at the Mercer Museum in Fontel Castle in Doylestown. And I am delighted to uh, welcome you all tonight to our virtual program tonight, uh, Measuring Weather, How Do You Catch a Cloud and Pin It Down, uh, presented tonight by Roger Turner um, of the Science Institute in Philadelphia. Now, we are so excited to get started, um, but before we do, you'll notice that your microphones um, and videos have automatically been turned off. During the, tonight's presentation, feel free to write any questions that you have in the chat or in the Q&A feature down below, and we will answer those all at the end of the program tonight. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Roger to begin the presentation. Hello, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thank you for coming to join me for this for this presentation. <clears throat> I'm going to put my put my screen he up here. Alrighty. Well, I'm taking my cue here, of course, from uh, the musical *The Sound of Music*. But instead of thinking about uh, a cloud in a metaphorical way, I, I want to think about clouds quite literally, but not just clouds, um, but all sorts of parts of the atmosphere here. So the weather is this incredibly difficult thing to understand, right? It's big, it's spread across the sky, it's, um, uh, it's all around the planet, it's uncontrollable. You can't do laboratory experiments on it or catch it in a beaker contrary to what general dynamics like to advertise in the 1950s. Uh, and it's constantly changing. And it's changing on a time scale that's really pretty rapid for science, right? It's not like uh, geology where change is slow and you can kind of get a, get a grasp on something. Weather is changing very fast by human time scales. And so one way to understand weather is to measure it, right? And then track it and compare and analyze all those measurements. But you'll have to measure it a lot. Uh, and you'll have to measure it in a lot of different places if you want to develop a broad understanding of how weather works. So today I'm going to give you a history of efforts to uh, understand and measure the weather. I'll make it quick and pleasant, a breezy um, history of meteorology, if you like. And we'll move through four strategies for, measure, for measuring the weather uh, and hopefully meet some interesting folks along the way. So first, let's look at um, efforts to quantify the air. So the key instruments for measuring weather were largely invented during that uh, outburst of passion for measurement that historians call the scientific revolution. During the 17th century, natural philosophers, as scientists at the time were called, they devised all sorts of machines to explore nature. Telescopes enabled astronomers to see the planets in detail, while microscopes made visible the tiny organisms that surround us. Natural philosophers imagined devices for measuring the qualities of the air as well. And then they worked with craftsmen and artisans to build those devices. Early thermoscopes, as they were called, measured the effect of heat um, by putting uh, a column of air in a tube with one end in a container of colored water. As the water warmed, it expanded, creeping up the tube. In 1610, Galileo, uh, more famous as an astronomer, perhaps than a meteorologist, uh, turned that water into wine and thus created the first um, uh, alcohol-based thermoscope. Later, by adding a standardized mathematical scale, uh, it turned the thermoscope into the more familiar thermometer that we know today. The British mechanical genius Robert Hooke adopted the freezing point of water as the zero point in 1664, while uh, the German instrument maker Daniel Fahrenheit later decided that mercury made a good material for measuring heat and then annoyingly for all of us, decided that 32 and 212 made useful reference numbers. Now, while Hooke was working um, with thermometers in 1664, uh, Francesco Foley in Italy invented the first practical device for measuring the humidity, an instrument called uh, the hygrometer. 120 years later, in 1784, the Swiss meteorologist and mountaineer Horace, Horace de Saussure constructed a hygrometer based on the way that hair twists with increasing humidity, as anybody knows who's gone to the beach, right? 
And so strands of long brunette um, hair actually became an element of one of meteorology's key instruments for more than the next 150 years. Now, the possibility of a vacuum and the weight of an air, of the weight of the air, or what we now know as atmospheric pressure, was a subject of great interest to 17th century natural philosophers. In 1644, Evangelista Torricelli um, devised a four foot long glass tube containing mercury inverted into a dish and used, uh, and used it for experiments to create a vacuum. But frustratingly, the height of the mercury column kept fluctuating uh, and it seemed to change with the weather. He suggested that it was the weight of the air itself that was changing from day to day, not a flaw in his instrument that actually was causing this variation in the height of, a mer of the mercury. Then later, um, using Torricelli's design, his colleague Vincento um, Viviani made the first mercury barometer. Uh, not pictured here, but uh, uh, the tipping bucket was another product of um, 17th century, uh, a famous 17th century polymath, in this case, right, the, um, the London architect, uh, Sir Christopher Wren, who invented um, this, uh, the kind of the modern form of the rain gauge. Now, these instruments all had remarkably long lives. They have been the basis for the general record keeping about the air for more than four centuries now. Their form has changed, but the, the basic um, process for measuring these things uh, has remained much the same. So in the 18th century, wealthy private citizens like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison used their own personal uh, meteorological instruments to record daily measurements in their weather diaries. Thomas Jefferson um, bought his first thermometer while writing the Declaration of Independence, and then he bought his first barometer a few days later following the signing of the documents. He was very upset when his instrument, when some of his instruments um, were destroyed when the British uh, uh, sacked Monticello um, during the Revolutionary War. But nonetheless, he had a, he had a, a personal um, uh, barometer and thermometer that he carried with him, uh, and uh, sort of small ones, not as accurate, not as useful. Um, but uh, he continued to make weather observations uh, every day um, from 1776 until 1816. Jefferson also badgered his colleague, James Madison to stick to the task and Madison's decades long or one decade long weather diary is preserved at the American Philosophical Museum just around the, the corner from the Science History Institute in Center City, Philadelphia. But these instruments could be expensive and the value of quantitative weather records depends on a long continuous run of measurements using instruments that are calibrated, accurate, that is to say, and standardized so that they can be easily compared. So one strategy to, was to develop government agencies to monitor the weather. Governments around the world established national weather services between the 1850s and the 1880s. Uh, but meteorological professionals who worked at these agencies were also supplemented by volunteers using government supplied instruments. Um, so in 1890, uh, the United States Congress established the Cooperative Observer Program. Uh, and women as well as men have volunteered um, over the decades, sometimes for several decades or, um, uh, you know, half their lives. Um, to take daily observations of temperature, precipitation, snow, and in some cases, evaporation and soil temperature. That's the, the instrument um, uh, sort of shelter um, covering the, the, the thermometer, um, the barometer, and the hygrometer in, uh, is in that white box. By 1895, there were more than 200, there were more than 2,000 cooperative um, stations covering all parts of the contiguous United States, even in parts of the country that were not yet officially states. And this, this photo that you see here is a photo of Pearl Smith in 1951, when she had been taking routine measurements in her yard for 48 years continuously. So um, let's, so after quantifying the weather, we can think of a second strategy to understand the, uh, to understand the air is by mapping it. Um, since we've talked about the invention of instruments as part of the scientific revolution, now let's talk about the movement of those weather observations as part of an information revolution. During the later 18th century, uh, this is a, not the usual information revolution, right? We're not talking about the 1990s, the information superhighway, that sort of thing. We're gonna go, we're gonna go back a little ways here. So during the later 18th century, it was the development of newspapers and well-organized efficient postal services that dramatically increased the flow of information through society. 
Coming with that flow of information was a new conception of weather. People began to understand storms as coherent entities, right? Things that move, not as transient disruptions of the air over a particular place. A storm became a thing that could move across um, space and time. One of the people that was contributing to this understanding was Benjamin Franklin, uh, here uh, seated behind Thomas Jefferson. In his role as a newspaper publisher, he gathered newspapers from across the colonies, looking, of course, for interesting stories and news. But during the, 18, the, the 1770s, he also realized that he could track reports of individual storms that were moving from colony to colony, city to city, and especially tracking, of course, storms that moved from north uh, to the north and to the east, right, following sort of the curve of, of um, the American colonies. Now, another example of um, uh, of this kind of uh, work comes from the British colonial offices that were spread across the Caribbean and the colonies in the 1780s. So in 1780, a powerful and long-lived hurricane swept through um, the Caribbean uh, and government officials in London could later reconstruct the track of the hurricane from the reports of destruction that they had received from various colonial governors. Of course, this took place quite a long ways after the fact, right? Now, a second wave of the information revolution came with the deployment of a network of telegraph lines during the middle decades of the 19th century. For the first time, weather information could move faster than the weather itself could. Maybe this would enable advances in prediction. Certainly that was the hope. And one of the more, I think, really delightful um, products of that time was the leech-based <laughs> um, electrical tempest prognosticator it was built in 1851 by the very appropriately named George Merriweather. Now he noted that leeches rise in a column of water when a storm approaches. And so he hoped that leeches would, uh, in these little bottles here down or along the bottom, would rise up and close in an electrical circuit, which would then trigger a message that would be sent down the telegraph line. Now that was not a very enduring strategy. Uh, instead, a more robust and uh, much longer lived strategy for weather forecasting involved analyzing maps. The new government weather services would coordinate observations at once all across the country. Then the observers would send their uh, instrument readings via telegraph. Clerks in a central office plotted these observations on a map while the meteorologists would then analyze the map, decide on a forecast and send that text, the text of that forecast out to offices and newspapers across the country, again by telegraph. So this, the kind of maps that were used for this sort of analysis were called synoptic maps um, because it showed the weather for all places, um, for a whole bunch, bunch of places all at once. And these maps were printed in newspapers and even drawn on huge glass boards that were then posted in stock exchanges um, where the latest weather news could drive trading in grain futures and other financial instruments. There was even one in the cloakroom of the US Senate updated uh, twice a day where it was apparently a constant subject of, of conversation amongst the senators. Now, a third strategy for understanding and measuring the weather um, is to fly through the weather. During the early history of flight, aviation was largely a public spectacle, right? Not very respectable, um, but an amazing thing to watch. Uh, to see the sort of the daring do. It was more of a stunt than something serious and significant and scientific. But there were a handful of men of science who were interested in using balloons to study the weather. People like um, the French scientist um, uh, Joseph Louis uh, Galusac and later the British meteorologist James Glacier flew in balloons to carry scientific instruments high above the ground. They sought to understand the vertical structure of the atmosphere, how temperature and pressure and humidity change as you go up. Maybe you've seen the recent movie, The, the Aeronauts, uh, where Eddie Redmayne plays James Glacier and Felicity Jones plays a fictional balloon pilot slash love interest. I think that film does um, a nice job of conveying the tensions around the scientific credibility of aviation and the dangers of flying, of being a flying meteorologist. So in short, I think we can say that during the, the 19th century, some scientists use meteorology to justify aviation. But that changed rapidly um, during the 20th century. Aviation became an important weapon during World War I, 
uh, and then it started to become commercially significant during the 1920s and especially during the 1930s. Aviation in turn justified new efforts to measure the weather in order to predict the weather better and make the skies safer for flyers. So a bit before the Wright brothers, five years before the Wright brothers, the future um, in 1898, the future um, weather bureau chief Charles F. Marvin had invented a new kind of measuring instrument called the kite meteorograph. This was a kind of all in one instrument that combined, but it hooked together a thermometer, a barometer and a hygrometer, uh, attached them to stylus, to markers that were that marked on a rotating drum that could record the changes in their measurements over time. So it was an, it was an automatic uh, recording instrument. And for three decades, meteorologists attached these meteorographs to, um, uh, to long strings of kites, sets of, sets of kites, uh, and then launched them up in the air as they began to, to measure how the upper atmosphere changed over time. But the kites were unwieldy and dangerous. Um, at the Blue Hill Observatory outside of Boston, uh, a kite famously um, broke loose once, about five miles of piano wire dragged across the ground, and it shorted out electrical cables that had powered the Bay Street, uh, the Bay State Street Electric Railway, and finally, the kite and all of its wires came to rest on the tracks of a railway station in East Braintree, where the morning's first train ran over the wire and became hopelessly entangled in it. So um, during the early part of the 1930s, the Weather Bureau uh, abandoned kites and switched instead to um, airplane uh, observations. So they bolted meteorographs to the struts of biplanes um, and sent these planes up to make daily flights to record conditions in the upper air, uh, in part really to create the data that was necessary for new aviation weather forecasting techniques. So this is, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of that. Johnny Starr here was celebrated as the best flying weatherman in the Weather Bureau's service. Um, he would fly up uh, each morning um, and uh, pilots like Starr um, earned um, uh, $25 only if they reached at least 13,000 feet. Plus they earned um, a 10% bonus for every additional thousand feet. They each wore these woolen um, gloves and fur-lined flight suits um, to help them deal with the wind and the cold, which could reach like 40 degrees below zero. And uh, Star was the star because he could uh, consistently reach two to 3,000 feet higher than most other pilots. So what about the cat though, right? That's the star of any, uh, any presentation on the internet. And that is um, the pet cat of, or sort of the resident cat of the uh, Omaha, Nebraska airport. And apparently this cat came out to meet uh, Johnny every, uh, after every flight. Um, but uh, interestingly, by 1938, um, when the Weather Bureau decided that they would only pay pilots if they reached at least 16,000 feet, uh, more and more pilots started carrying cats and dogs and sometimes even squirrels aloft with them. Uh, and the, these animals were kind of, um, uh, you know, cats in the coal mine, canaries in the coal mine, um, uh, if you will, because as the oxygen dwindled, the animals' heads would start to droop, alerting the pilots that um, they uh, needed to be on the lookout for um, hypoxia and, uh, and had better start coming down. Uh, nonetheless, uh, 12 pilots were killed making airplane observations between 1931 and 1938. Now, um, pilots were increasingly um, replaced uh, during the late 1930s by a new machine that the New York Times uh, initially called robot balloons uh, or robot weathermen sometimes. And meteorologists though carried this, called this instrument the radiosonde or rayson for short. And these electronic, um, these electronic instruments were, would broadcast measures of temperature and humidity and atmospheric pressure as they ascended at a constant rate. The balloons burst around 70,000 feet and a small parachute carried the instrument safely to the ground. Um, attached to the radio zone was a little label that the Weather Bureau included asking finders to return the instrument by mail. Uh, and here's one of my favorite letters that the Bureau got back um, along with a returned radio sonde. January 29th, 1947. I found this instrument at 11.30 a.m. on a stream called Hell's Creek. It was bitter cold. I was shivering as I fed the cattle. My whiskey just gave out. Thinks I, here it comes on parachute. <clears throat> no pay, take a hint. 
other letters the Weather Bureau included, um, got included a tale of sheriffs shooting a radio on to pieces as it hung in a tree, a complaint about a little girl who stole it from the letter writer's 10 year old son, and a man who returned a radio on uh, radio on along with a wish that the Weather Bureau would write to the governor of Arkansas to cut his 21 year prison sentence for second degree murder. Now, one of the um, sorry. Um, now one of um, the things that I really love about these weather robots is that they had hair. Um, so this is actually part of a, um, a U.S. radio zond from the 1950s, uh, and the hygrometer still used the twisting strands of hair to measure humidity, just like um, Saussure's did all the way back in the 1780s. Back to the slides. So the, um, the final way of measuring the weather that I want to explore involves um, bouncing radiation off of the weather. So the advance of radio set the stage um, for the development of radar. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that. Now, radar is a complicated technology. Um, fortunately, there is a very talented cartoony meteorologist who um, has made uh, a simplified diagram that I think will make it much easier to understand. And that's enough of the technical details of radar. So one of the leaders of developing uh, weather radar was a woman named Pauline Austin, who has a PhD in physics, um, who had worked on the military application of radar during World War II. After she had a baby during the war, um, she actually convinced her boss to let her do classified work at home, uh, since she said only she and the infant would ever see it. She was married to a meteorology professor at MIT, and in 1947, he was consulting with the Air Force to create a plan for a weather radar research center. When the committee decided that they would need a full-time man to study electromagnetic theory, uh, Pauline Austin chimed in, would you consider a half-time woman? She later became uh, head of MIT's weather radar research project and a valued but often uncredited mentor to a generation of meteorology students. So these days, um, weather radar is so familiar from our TV screens and our computer apps that it's easy to forget how surprising and hard to interpret um, those weather radar returns were at first. And one of the people who really transformed the way that we think about and understand um, weather radar was the newsman, Dan Rather. When Hurricane Carla approached the Texas coast in 1961, he went down to the Weather Bureau office and he broadcast images of the radar scope. It looked like this. But Rather then had the inspiration to lay a transparent map of the coastline over the radar scope. Now it looked like this. As Rather recounted much later, when I said, this is the actual scale, there's the state of Texas, one inch equals 50 miles, you could hear people in the studio gasp. With their eyes, they could easily measure the size of the hurricane that was bearing down on them. And so Rather's innovation was one of the communication um, advances that helped transform a meteorological research device into a tool for public warning. The images on 1950s radar scopes were placeless, right? Reflections of events high in the atmosphere, divorced from locations familiar to us ground-dwelling human beings. But introducing a map brought the weather down to earth, reconnecting storms to the places where people live. Radar waves are not the only kind of radiation that can be bounced off of clouds. Visible light and infrared energy, heat, are also kinds of radiation, and these can be measured from space. The Television Infrared Observation Satellite, or TIROS, um, was launched in 1960, the first, um, basically the first world's first operational weather satellite. And since then, weather satellites have become essential for monitoring hurricanes, discovering unusual cloud formations, and producing data essential to forecasting. Later, satellites integrated active radar sets as well to enable them to estimate uh, local rainfall amounts, um, producing some of the first really um, credible uh, data sets of tropical rainfall and helping to measure um, the Earth's water balance. Because satellites can be used um, to measure the heat balance of the planet, right, using these kinds of infrared measurements, NASA has become the largest single funder of climate science in the US federal government today, 
I think a great deal of the facts that we know about climate change come uh, from the most popular and trusted federal science agency. Now, meteorologists could begin to study the global atmosphere as a whole by using computers to organize and combine observations from satellites. One of the scientists working on this project was Nathaniel Woodrick, the first at IBM and later as a professor at Howard University. Woodrick used a radiometer, right, a, an instrument for measuring uh, the, um, the flux or the power of radiation bouncing off of um, coming through the atmosphere. He used a radiometer on the Nimbus satellite there in the background um, to measure the deflection of starlight through the top of the Earth's atmosphere. It was a technique that made it possible to measure atmospheric pressure in the highest parts of the atmosphere that were otherwise inaccessible from the ground. These measurements were then fed into computer simulations of the atmosphere that were used to predict the weather. As Woodruff described his work in this ad from 1968, quote, weathermen need more precise facts about the atmosphere, millions per day from all over the world. My job is to see how computers can help. The integration of satellites and computers made it possible to measure the global atmosphere as a single entity. All right, so I'm going to um, wrap up with a short clip from the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, this is an episode from 1964 when Granny's weather wisdom uh, tells her that it is going to rain while the Weather Bureau and the, um, the, the television uh, weather forecasters as well say that it will not rain. Um, and at the end of the show, um, the Weather Bureau forecaster comes to the Clampett Mansion to explain how modern meteorology works. All right, and what I love about this um, this clip, uh, about three minutes or so long. What I love about it is that um, it's sort of a really a wonderful uh, source for seeing how the many ways um, that had historically evolved for measuring the weather fit together, work together to produce um, the modern weather forecast. And simultaneously, of course, um, how the modern weather forecast and the modern meteorologist becomes an object of um, comic derision, right? Here we go. By way of prefacing what you are about to see, may I say that from the dawn of his existence, man was in awe of the elements. But in time, man's awe of the elements gave way to investigation. And today... I'm just going to pause for one second. I need to fix the... Um, I need to fix the sound here. Oops. Sorry, this has all gotten a little confused. Um. Oh dear. Um. Karina, is there a way you can um, pop in to uh, help this help this out? Was the sound working there? Of course. Okay, great. It was working on my end. Um, if I could have anyone who's in the chat pop in, was it working for everyone on the audience end? If not, all right, I'm getting a response that it was working, Roger. Oh, all right, very good. Okay, I figured out, I think, I think what I need to do. So I think I'm ready to go back. All right. And if anyone has any issues with sound, just go ahead and pop it in the chat and we'll go ahead and restart too. All right. So is this, uh, can you see the, um, can you see the, uh, the, the film right now? Yes, we can see All the right. film right now. Here we go. We no longer have to rely on such things as prognosticating beetles. Don't you call my beetles whatever it is you just called them. Yes, and maybe you better get on with the movie. <laughs> I think you're right. Those birds be. Today, weather reports from every part of the world can be obtained almost instantly. 
and they are the basis of modern weather forecasting. Because weather on Earth is affected by conditions above Earth, race sun balloons are launched into the atmosphere at stations throughout the world. <laughs> Instead of looking for weather signs, they playing with balloons. <laughs> Pressure, temperature and winds are plotted on map segments, which are joined together to form a large map of simultaneous observations. But a revolution is taking place in forecasting techniques. Electronic computers can analyze data and predict tomorrow's weather map. The frontiers of meteorology have been greatly expanded by the use of Tyros. That's a big one! Here you see Tyros 2, 19 inches high, 42 inches in diameter, and weighing approximately 280 pounds. That Tyros may be big, but he ain't half the beetle Cecil is. <laughs> Here is Tyros atop its launch vehicle, about to be rocketed into space. I ain't seen nothing like that since the time your steel blew up. <laughs> yes, the modern science of meteorology has removed weather forecasting from the realm of superstition and coincidence enabling me to say with complete confidence, it will not rain tonight. <laughs> well, Granny, what do you think? I think she better get her car under cover. It's gonna rain in one minute. <laughs> Granny, has all this been for naught? Hasn't this mass of scientific evidence convinced you that my prediction is the correct one? <laughs> better get a move on. <laughs> Let's switch back to. Um, all right. Well, um, so I'm gonna gonna conclude by saying that um, I think it's fair to say that um, our understanding of climate change today, um, our realization that humans have created a climate emergency that threatens our society, um, comes out of a long history of efforts to measure the weather. Right? Ingenious instruments have made it possible um, to measure much about. Uh, much about the world, um, but I don't think we should focus on just the objects and just the inventors alone, right? History shows us that the secret to measuring weather ultimately lies in combining instruments with innovative social organizations uh, managed by government bureaucrats, right? The National Weather Service is um, one of those organizations to which I think we owe a debt of gratitude, um, even when it rains unexpectedly. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. All right. right. I'm going to. There we go. All right. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put in the chat. Roger, thank you. Um, I know as a personal person, um, those who know me know that I avidly check the weather um, all the time. Uh, it's constantly open on my computer, so I love learning the history of where we got to because I will have that radar up and. I never really thought about not being able to read the radar someday of how it got to the colors that we have today. Um, how did you get involved in meteorology? Has it always been a, a long time passion for you? Yeah, I, I grew up in Colorado. So um, there was, I grew up seeing a lot of sky. Um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, one of the probably the, the main and not, not too far away from where I grew up. Um, but actually, I got into it actually through um, research, some uh, kind of a very curious paper I read as an undergraduate about, uh, about weather control. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, um, that became a totally a, a really fascinating subject of efforts during sort of starting in the 1950s to, um, to, trans to change the weather intentionally by putting uh, either dry ice or a chemical called um, silver iodide into it. And that got me really interested in sort of questions of um, who owns nature, who controls nature, um, how when controversies over uh, environmental politics arise, um, 
who counts as an expert and uh, and what are the what are the terms on which we we negotiate on those kinds of controversies? Mm -hmm. So I started researching that and then kind of from there uh, worked backwards into uh, worked backwards into uh, the history of the history of meteorology. So interesting. Don't see any questions. I'll give everyone just a few more moments to type in some uh, questions if they have any. Roger, do you have a favorite measuring tool mm. that has either stayed the same from its invention, like we still, the barometer hasn't changed a whole lot, or I guess we can leave it at, do you have a favorite measuring tool for measuring the weather? Oh, um, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, there, there are sort of these, um, uh, well, I do have a, I do have a, a, a favorite, um, a favorite kind of piece of, of, uh, of popular culture. Um, so there's a, there's an interesting, one of the sort of the bad boys of, um, the bad boys of 20th century meteorology, uh, it was a man named Irving Crick, um, who was, uh, was involved in, uh, on, on, uh, he mispredicted um, the weather for uh, D-Day, but fortunately was overruled, uh, and then spent the rest of his life claiming that, of course, he was he was the one who had produced the right the right outcome. And then he also went on to be a to be uh, uh, a, an influential and controversial um, weather modification operator. Um, but um, there was a brief period of time when, uh, before weather modification took off, um, he was in a private he had had run a private consulting business and. Um, uh, and uh, when his affair during World War II came out, his his wife got the company in the divorce settlement. So he, he was kind of casting about and he created these, um, this sort of, uh, it's about a foot long and it's kind of made out of cast aluminum. And it's, uh, it, it, it's designed to, you sort of dial in, you look up at the sky and you dial in what the weather conditions are. Uh, you sort of twist a, twist a knob to show you, find a picture that looks like the clouds that you see. And then you dial in uh, in a different way um, which direction the winds are coming from, and then you read off at the top uh, a forecast for the next 24 hours. Um, so that's one of my that's one of my favorite objects. You can find them. They're called they're called the, the Irving Crick Weather Guide. You find them on eBay now for for anywhere between 20 and 50 dollars. Um, so they're that's that's one of my favorite objects. I would say. Uh, I like but that. I I think what I love about these instruments is how is how durable many of these uh, many of these instruments are and how how much even the records that were made uh, 150 200 even in some cases back in the 17th century um, still are used in uh, in informing um, climate models and uh, and invalidating um, climate data that's I, I, fascinating I, I love that um, we have a question um, from one of our guests is how do airplanes safely fly into hurricanes? That's a great question. Um, that's a great question, and um, that was certainly one of the one of the questions I had for a long time. Um, when I was a graduate student, I, I got a fellowship from the American Meteorological Society, and we got to go. Um, and one of the things we did um, for the fellows is, is we went to their their annual meeting, which happened to be in New Orleans that year, and so we actually got a chance to go out and talk to the hurricane hunters um, as uh, as as part of the meeting, which were, which were flying out of uh, the, the airfield at, at Lake Charles um, that, uh, at that time. And so, I, you know, I, one of the questions I asked, I asked one of the pilots was, um, you know, what's it like flying in 200 mile an hour winds? And he said, well, or I guess 150 mile an hour winds. I hope I didn't say 200 miles an hour, it may be a little fast. Um, but uh, he said, well, you know, our our plane goes 400 miles an hour normally. So that's, uh, it's not the wind speed that's the problem, it's the turbulence. Um, and uh, that's the real, that's the real danger. And so, I mean, they're strong, they're very strong planes. They have a lot of power, a lot of energy. They're, they're military, uh, they're military planes um, or former military planes um, that do most of the hurricane hunting. And um, they, they're very skilled pilots. Um, and they're pretty careful about um, uh, trying to stay in parts of the storm that are likely to be um, not as turbulent uh, as they could be. Um, but they're also just very brave <laughs> pilots. So um, it's been, I think there was, a, there was a Hurricane Hunter plane that crashed in the early 1960s, but one hasn't crashed since then. Um, and they do fly at higher altitudes than they, than they did 
uh, when that uh, when that plane crashed in the in the sixties. And now they rely more on various kinds of instruments that they can drop through the storm to get um, really low level measurements. So that's a that's an instrument called a drop sound. Um, so again, using the idea of of a sounding instrument. Um, so those those drop through the clouds on a parachute and then radio back data as they're coming through. Definitely a very important job for us receiving that information for everyone else. So that's incredible. Well, I don't see any more questions. Um, so I wanted to mention that this is uh, uh, the last of our programs in relation to our Magnificent Measures exhibit here at the Mercer Museum. Um, we, it is on display until uh, September 5th. So come check it out if you have not had a chance to yet. Um, but otherwise, Roger, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. Um, I know I've learned so much and I know our guests have as well. So thank you, thank you. Um, and if anyone is interested in learning more about the Science Institute in Philadelphia, check out their website um, and learn more about what they're up to as well. Thank right. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night.